Welcome to the Ask Julie Ryan Show. I'm Julie, your host, and I'm so delighted you could join us this week. My intention in doing this show is to provide information, insight, and comfort to people all around the world by helping to answer life's unanswerable questions. And do I have a thrilling show set up for you? Literally thrilling, because one of my favorite people on the planet, an absolutely extraordinary woman, you'll see why when you meet her, Katie McQuaid is with us today. So Katie, welcome. Hi, Julie. Thanks for having me. So excited to be here. Oh my gosh. Katie, you really truly are one of my favorite people on the planet. And and everybody that's watching or listening, when we talk, we could talk for hours and then we're getting ready to get off and I'll say, okay, just one more thing. Or Katie will say, okay, just one more thing. And I'm and I'm just want to say, okay, we're on a time limit today. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep us contained as much as I can. But let me tell you guys about Katie and you'll see why she's just so amazing. Katie McQuaid is an award-winning author, presenter, and leadership consultant who spent more than three decades with the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency, also known as the CIA, including 12 years living abroad. Her work in communities all over the world inspired her to share the art of humble leadership with her clients. Katie was the first female senior executive in the CIA's logistics career service, as well as the first senior executive support officer in a South Asia war theater. She held a key support officer position during the transition of U.S. intelligence activities from one city to another in one of the largest European offices. And Katie, does that mean that you'd have to kill us all first before you could tell us about that? I might not have to kill you, but I'm not allowed to tell you. Exactly okay, there you go. That works. sounds so CIA ish. I love that. <laughs> yes, in your, when is. I read that in your bio, I laughed. I thought, okay, here we go. In her forthcoming book, Humble Yet Fierce, Katie reflects on her wide ranging life experiences and how they impacted her leadership style. And Katie's a graduate of my angelic attended training. So she's incorporated woo woo into her life as well. So Katie, what an impressive resume. My goodness, just you are you are just a, a renaissance woman, a one of a kind. I think they broke the mold and how fabulous that we all get to talk with you about what makes you so special. So let's start off. How'd you, as a senior executive in the black and white world of international intelligence, get interested in woo-woo? Well, I think I was interested in woo-woo even as a kid. I've always just um, been interested in many religions and many things. I've always had this ability. I used to call them flashes. I would get these insights about things, and I just knew things even as a kid. And I had to keep it quiet for many years because I was raised in a a home where it wasn't allowed and the CIA, I kind of had to be quiet and covert about my spiritual side there, but it's something I've always had in me. And and I've just wanted to grow that skill and ability to that woo woo side because it's, it's energy, it's spirit, it's God, it's all those things. And it's been a huge part of my life. And now I, I just wanted to learn more. And I loved your class. No, I was so honored to have you in. And I know you've gotten really involved in the AAT, as we call it, Angelic Attendant Training Community. And uh, I know I always say it's going to enhance your life in unimaginably amazing ways. Have you found that to be the case too? Oh, absolutely. One, the connections, the regular contact with people through the program, like the regular calls and support that we have for each other. And your support has been just amazing. And then I've also realized my life is opening up and I'm uh, more confident in my, in my woo-woo abilities and trusting that the information that comes in. And so that I'm al- allowing myself to take the bigger steps in life that needed to be taken because I'm trusting the woo-woo. There you go. 
Good. Yeah. So you mentioned that you grew up on a house where woo woo wasn't really discussed. Tell us about your upbringing, about your education, that kind of thing. What led you ultimately to have a career for over 30 years with the Central Intelligence Agency of all places? Yeah. Well, the I was raised in a home with four brothers. I have four brothers and my parents were very Catholic. Uh, we and we went to church every day. I have five great aunts that are nuns, so the Catholicism side in my upbringing is very strong, and not a belief that there's other religions really, like not accepting, I should say, of other religions. So um, that's why I always felt like I had to keep the woo-woo side kind of quiet, even though I have some great aunts in England that were tea leaf readers. My mom has since told me that my great aunts were, they would read the tea leaves in England and which is a form of woo woo, right? So that's how um, I just kept it quiet. And, uh, but I also believe my dad was a mystic. Actually, I I honestly believe he had that gift as well. And um, we all have it, but he. Why do you say that about your dad? I just, the, he had a way of knowing things and, and he and I could communicate in a way that we didn't even have to say words. We just communicated and he would see things. He would see the big picture. I think we call it common sense, but I think it was actually his knowing that um, he could predict things or he just knew things that weren't really obvious on the surface. Oh, I think the Catholics do a really good job of getting us prepared for woo-woo though, because as little children, we're taught about angels and saints and the Holy Spirit and other religions and traditions do as well. But I have found that it does lay a foundation that we can build upon. Have you found that to be the case as well? Oh, absolutely. Because just that belief in God, right? And that whole, that sets the stage for a life led by spirit, right? Whether we call it God or the universe or whatever our chosen word is, that's developed in a home, in a, in a Christian home or a Catholic home is that relationship with God, talking to God, praying to God, um, praying to the saints. And we didn't um, talk to angels in my, as I was growing up, maybe a guardian angel, but I didn't really know much about angels growing up. Um, but Did you say the guardian angel prayer? Guardian, yes. Angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love commits me here. You could probably recite it too. Yeah. I, I can after all of these years. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's as a little child. And then what happened? Where did you what, tell us about high school, college, and then how eventually you ended up at the CIA? Uh, so I went to high school. Um, my family moved to Northern Virginia when I was about 12 years old. And so I went to McLean High School, which is where the CIA headquarters is in McLean, Virginia or Langley, Virginia. And so I grew up right in, near the agency, not knowing that I was all my neighbors, practically their parents were at the CIA as well. Um, and so I went to high school, I swam at, um, through high school, and I got a college scholarship to Penn State as a, a Nittany Lion. Um, I got a full scholarship to Penn State. And I don't really remember the woo-woo side through high school and college, but I do remember, um, I'll tell you that later, but the, uh, so when I graduated from Penn State, the job market was in the tank, it was 1983. And it was really hard to find employment. And the government was was hiring back in those days. And the CIA in particular was hiring women. They wanted to increase their diversity. They knew they needed to bring in more women. So a neighbor friend um, said to my mom, give me Katie's resume. And I kept putting it off and putting it off because I didn't really want to go to work at the CIA. I, don't, I wanted to stay up in State College, Pennsylvania. Um, long story short is I ended up accepting, I interviewed in finance and logistics. I was offered to pick which career service I wanted and I chose logistics, but I really only thought I'd be there for two or three years. I thought, ah, I'll figure out what I want to do with my life after two or three years. And then 32 years later, I retired. <laughs> so, <laughs> Well, you were led obviously to... Yes be there. I think even with the fact that you moved there as a child and you were surrounded by people whose families 
were supported by the CIA. It was almost like you were being immersed in that energy, even as a child and a teenager and a college yeah. person. I love to tell the story. I would walk to school in the morning and I would time it just perfectly. I'd get up to the stop sign at the end of the street. And one of my friend's dad was always taking him to school and they would offer me a ride. So I'd get a ride with Mr. Vartanian. And I went to work at the CIA and I was in my first day and I hear on the phone, Dick Vartanian. And I went, what? He works at the CIA? <laughs> like I couldn't believe it. So oh my I had gotten a ride to school almost every day with a CIA, an undercover CIA person and didn't know it. That's so funny. When I, it reminds me of when I was a kid, my dad worked for the phone company for his whole career. And when we were really little, we would all wait at the stop sign at the corner for him when he'd come home from work and 10 of us would pile into the car, you know, all the neighbor kids, my siblings and I, and we would, he had a phone in his car. This is in the sixties. This is in the early sixties, like 63, 64. And we would call my mom and we'd say, hey, is dinner ready? And then he'd drive us into the garage and then we'd all pile out and go in for dinner. But that was our routine every night. Same thing. And and then when they started having cell phones in cars, I, I'm old enough to remember when they were hardwired into cars. Yes. Yeah. And and I remember thinking, God, my dad was so with it that when I was three and four, he had a cell phone in his car. It wasn't a cell phone. It was who knows how it was transmitted, but, uh, but he got to do that too. And I too was part of that recruiting thing of women. I graduated in 81 from the mm -hmm. Ohio State University, Penn State's <laughs> rival. Yes. And I've been, to, I've been to football games at Penn State and Happy Valley. It's really fun mm -hmm. there. It's beautiful. What a, what a fun event to be able to go. We should go sometime to the Ohio State Penn State game together. Yeah. That would be fun. It would be a lot yeah. of fun. I've been yeah. to the Buckeye Stadium as well. I've gone to a Penn State Ohio State game in, in Columbus. So yeah. But but the thing about uh back then they were trying to integrate women into the workforce. And I was part of that same trend where I went to work for a big huge multi-billion dollar company that had a quota of women. And that's how I got in the medical business was I wanted to work for this company and I, it helped me get hired. And I'm all for that. What the heck? Because we paved the way for all these future generations of women now that are entering the workforce that are clueless. And, and before us, it was the Gloria Steinem's and the Bella Abzug's and, you know, all those women who really laid the foundation for for us to come in. But back in the day, I don't know about you, but we didn't wear pants to work. We wore suits that had skirts and heels. I wore heels every day, traipsing around those hospitals, selling hospital supplies. Did you as well? Oh, yes. The blue polyester. Mine were more like the pumps that the military wears, the women in the military wear. But yeah, we had a skirts and blazers and they were navy blue polyester. Oh my. A you had a uniform? Not, not really a uniform, but that was quote the uniform, like to fit in with the guys. That's what we did. We oh, dressed like the guys. That makes sense. That makes sense. Oh, good. So how much intuition is used in the intelligence arena? Is it a learned skill? Is it taught? Is it I, there? One of my favorite YouTube documentaries is third eye spies where there were guys that were using uh, intuition and telep telepathy, telepathy really, that were working with Stanford and they were working with some of the intelligence agencies. Can you talk about that at all or is that off limits? Um, I don't, I know it happens. I don't have firsthand knowledge of it, like, but I do know it, it happens because yes, but I, can I speak about it? Not really knowledgeably. Well, of the people that you know that are in the intelligence agencies, do you believe that they are using intuition or a gut feeling in addition to the facts to make decisions? Absolutely. Have you witnessed that? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, and it's some of its repeated patterns. Sometimes it's, it's intuition. They know, they just know the behavior behind what's happening or what's logically going to happen next. They, they anticipate really well. And that comes from intuition. 
it's some learned and some experienced, but there's also this sixth sense that kicks in and the better people at the agency and the stronger leaders were the ones that had that really, that ability to insight in not just in operations, but in managing people as well. Right? Mm-hmm. It's, it came in all forms. Well, I have clients who are corporate executives that run huge multi-billion dollar, sometimes global companies. And and they're into this. It's really interesting. They're not out front about it, but they they utilize intuition. They utilize communicating with spirit. They utilize talking to people like me who say, okay, you know what? Here's what I'm getting. Can you validate or corroborate that? What are you getting along those lines? And and I find that fascinating. We all come in with the ability. I think most of us just don't recognize when we're using it. I agree with that completely. Here's a little simple story that to, I had a friend, we we grew up in the agency together and before internet and before cell phones and that type of thing, we used to write letters. And she would say to me, I don't know how you do it, Katie, but I get a letter from you. She could be in Tokyo or Germany or you, you name it. She goes, you always know when something's going on with me. And, I didn't write her regularly. It was just, I would get a flash and I would know to write her and something was going on in her life. And I think we do use it in ways like we we don't give ourselves credit, even running large operations. There's a lot of intuition that goes on. I agree. Organizations. When you say you get a flash, what can you describe that? What does that mean? Well, now I don't, I I used to call it a flash and now I understand it's my intuition, but I would get this like, oh, Julie Ryan just came to my, to my mind, like, or I'll think about somebody really quickly. And I, and I've come to know, to pay attention to those. When I think about Julie Ryan, something's going on or I need to reach out. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's the key too, is to take action. When we get that guidance, when we get those, I call them hits, you call them flashes. Mm -hmm. When we get that information coming in, usually out of the blue, it's not precipitated by anything in particular, take action, send them a text, call them, send them a letter. (laughs) Back in the old days, send them a letter. Back in the old days. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Think of how much history we're losing by not writing letters anymore in our families and our whatever, just because all those letters, I have letters of my dad when my dad was in the seminary in Rome, he was studying to be a priest. And I have five years, six years worth of letters that he wrote to his family and his family wrote to him during that time. And it's so historic. My goodness. I felt like I knew my grandparents better after reading those letters and they long had been gone. They'd been long Mm -hmm. gone by the time I was reading these letters, but it was, yeah, it was interesting on that. So back, back to being a leader, especially in the, in an intelligence situation, how does somebody have the confidence to make decisions when lives, sometimes many, many lives are at stake. What gives a person, you or a colleague, the strength and the golden ovary or brass ball courage to (laughs) really decide golden ovaries are for women, of course, and Mm -hmm. brass balls are for guys, of course. But how do you really have the confidence to be able to say, okay, this is what we're going to do. And we've looked at the outcome potential, but this is what we're going to do. Let's go. I think that's, for me, it was when my intuition was there, right? Like I just knew, I trusted my knowing to go forward or not. And I think um, part of it's training and being prepared, but also it takes, it does take a lot of courage because we put people's lives in danger every day. Um, It's a very stressful job at certain, because of people's lives are at risk, right? I not only the people I worked with, but the the assets and the people that are giving us the intelligence, right? We have to make sure what we do is absolutely perfect so that they don't get compromised uh, at their ends as well. So um, it does take a lot of courage. And that's, I do talk about that in some of my speeches. I, I think courage is really huge. Like we've all been courageous though, not just 
in these in the CIA or leadership, but every every one of us has to have courage. We've all faced those tough days where it took every um, amount of every lick of courage to step through something, and um, knowing that it's always there is really important. So as the decisions got bigger for me at the agency, and as more people were under my purview. I had to tap in those small moments of courage, like at Penn State, when I did something courageous, like I remind myself that that courage is there. I've done courageous things and I'm able to make these bigger decisions. That makes sense. Do you look back on your life? I know I certainly do and think, oh my gosh, I can't believe if I had the courage to do that. What, what's an example of something when you were in school that happened that you think took courage and where did that courage come from? Where, how do you think you developed that? Uh, well, the story that comes, what comes to mind is my dad died very suddenly right before Christmas of my freshman year. And um, the Olympics had been canceled and there were a lot of things that happened in a very quick, in a short period of time in my freshman year at Penn state, right before Christmas. And when I came home for his funeral, I didn't want to go back to Penn State. You know, I was, I loved Penn State, but it still wasn't home yet, right? It took a lot of courage for me to get, go back to Penn State, get back on the swim team, finish out my freshman year. And then I didn't really swim particularly well at Penn State. I could break school records in practice, but I'd get in the meet and I would choke. And that took a lot of courage to keep showing up those years that I really wasn't performing at the level I thought it should be. It took a lot of courage to just keep showing up for my teammates, for my coaches. Um, so that was where I practiced courage and <laughs> was yeah. showing up when things weren't going my way. And I was very close to my father. And when he died suddenly and I was away at school and then I just didn't want to go back to school. I understand. You were part of the Olympics. I haven't heard that chapter in your life. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I qualified for the Olympic trials in 1979. And that's the year that um, Jenny Carter, we boycotted the Olympics. So we, they didn't have the trials. So I don't know if I would have made the team or not. I never officially made the team, but yeah, that was actually pulled from me right when I was in college. <laughs> Like they, the boycott happened and that was a rough, a rough spot for me because I'd worked my whole life. Um, about 15 people at the time would qualify for tri Olympic trials. So I was one of, I had a one in 15 shot to make the team, wow. but there was, there was no Olympics. So we I remember when that was going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember that. What was your, your uh, top stroke, I guess you call it. What was your top what do you call it? Event or? Yeah. event. I was a 200 breaststroke was my best events. And then 400 IM individual medley. Um, oh. So I was a middle distance swimmer. Yeah. What's individual medley. Uh, it's all, it's the IM, the butterfly backstroke breaststroke and freestyle. It's like 400 IM is a hundred yards of each or a hundred meters of each stroke. Oh it's gosh. like what Michael Phelps did. He's, you know, the 200 IM and. Okay. Wonderful. Well, and obviously you're being an athlete for a good portion of your life. Half of your life is still serving you well now because you look, you look like you're still very fit. Thank you. Thanks. I, I had my moments actually. I, I gained, I gained some weight at, um, in college and I had to keep getting it off. I would gain it over the summer and take it off and most people look at me now and say, you never wrestled with your weight. I'm like, oh, I did. Yeah. Well, especially when you're playing at that high level as an athlete, you know, they're, they're monitoring <laughs> probably every extra ounce that you're bringing in because it affects your time, I would think. Absolutely. We used to have to weigh in every day and it was pretty brutal. <laughs> so. Oh my goodness. Oh, wow. Well. well, back to the CIA for a minute. Are there many women executives at the CIA in, or in any of the intelligence agencies, either here in America or throughout the world? The question is, are there any senior executives? Are there any women, female oh. senior executives? Are there many female executives? Has that started to become more 
balanced or is it still predominantly male? It's predominantly male. There, um, the number of senior executive women in this intelligence community is about 31%, which is actually below the amount of women that are in the workforce, right? So that there's 31% of the senior executives are women, which is way better than when I was growing up in the agency. Um, but we're still behind. We still lag behind in terms of representation at the senior executive level. And I, yeah, they've, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, give us an idea of what it was like to be in a room with however many people where you were presenting something or you were in charge of something and everybody else, and there weren't any other women in the room. Give us a, just kind of an overview of, what that felt like to you and how did you, did you have a workaround for that? I, one of my last jobs at the agency, every morning I went into a seven 30 meeting and there were 40 men in the room and I was the only female and I was, you know, a senior executive at the time. And I tend to be quiet by nature anyway, but so one of my tools is I listen and I also observe a room really well. I see who's sitting where, who's talking. And my um, kind of strategy was to speak up when I really had something important to say. And it turned out that people would say, when Katie talks like E.F. Hutton, it's like E.F. Hutton. Um, But I, you know, I could have probably spoken up more and sooner in my career. But it is um, just like the last five years of my career career. I was in a room every morning at an an ops meeting looking at what's happened around the world. And I was pretty much the only female. Sometimes there would be a female briefer that would come in, but rarely was there a woman at my level in the meeting. And it's, it can be intimidating, but you learn, I learned over time to just be strong and speak up. I had to speak up. It was important. So how do you equate being as successful as you were in that male dominated environment. And I would imagine probably dodging some landmines along the way with colleagues and people who, who perhaps had egos that were just out of control. Was there a strategy that you implemented other than you kind of got a feel for the room. Can you describe that to us? And was there anything else? Like, did you use humor to diffuse awkward situations? Did you have somebody who was a mentor that you could go to and say, Hey, look, this person's acting like a fool and it's really getting in the way of us achieving our goals. Can you give us some stories or some, some uh, ideas about, what you found was really were strategies that were really successful in helping you navigate that landscape. I think the first thing is really, it's important to have trusted mentors or friends that like you could, I could really um, count on to give me honest, am I overreacting? Am I underreacting? Um, that, that was really important part of it. Um, I like, I loved humor and, kind of like self-deprecating humor, we would have conferences. And the joke to this this day is Katie always comes with her hair wet. Like I would come down to these conferences in the morning with my hair wet. I'm like, oh, once a swimmer, always a swimmer. But just kind of trying to be me and not trying to be something like be my authentic self was really important. Um, I think a really important thing for me was to stay true to who I was and I could tell story after story where I had to like stand, stand in my integrity and I was unwilling to do things that weren't legal or things that um, somebody asked me to do that weren't right. And so I just, I had to learn to stay in my integrity. But another important thing I did was I always, I just said, yes. I like, I love to tell people, just say yes. You don't know where it's going to land. Like I would get on a plane in four days and be, in the war zone, they called me and said, Hey, we need somebody to go to the war zone. That it was the first Gulf war. We need you to get over there in four days. And I was, I just said, yes, because I trusted that I was going to be safe. And I trusted that this was being presented to me for a reason. 
So I love to tell people just say yes. I mean, there's our, there are times when you have to say no, but there are like, I just say yes, these opportunities land for us. And I think, and then I also think teamwork is another thing that I'm a really good team builder and I built really strong teams and I loved being a part of a, a well working team. So I think teamwork is another thing that's essential. We can't do it alone. It's too hard. <laughs> and um, especially as a female, if you're in the minority in a room or people who are the in a minority in a room, being part of a team helps kind of forge through some of those bigger time challenges or operations. And we get a better result when we work on a team because if we're open to ideas and listening to each other, um, I think team, so teamwork, just say yes. I also get help when you need help, call a coach, call a Julie Ryan, right? <laughs> like I, it, we can't do it alone. I can't stress that enough. That was super important. And most importantly, stay true to yourself. Like I had to stay true to who I was. And there were times that I thought my career was over because I said no to like the executive director at the agency. He asked my boss and I to do something that um, was illegal. And we said no. And I thought that was my career, but I was unwilling to do what he asked us to do. He ended up going to jail three years later. He, um, oh, he did. But at the time, I didn't know that. Like he was bulletproof. Nobody could do anything to hurt this guy. His name is Dusty. And my boss and I stood up to him and... The workforce saw that I could wake up every morning and look at myself in the mirror and the next promotion wasn't important to me. Doing the right thing was important. Well, and that's what got you so much credibility because people saw you say, yeah, this isn't right. I'm not doing this. And so they knew that they could trust you. Yeah. How do you assemble a team that's going to be the comprised of the optimal players, not only ones to get the job accomplished, but also ones with whom you can work from a personality standpoint. And how do you manage lots of different personalities and get people, and maybe this comes from your sports background, your athlete background, how do you get them to be focused on the goal and to stay stay in alignment with whatever the the objectives and the ultimate goal are? So that's a great question. Communication is, is so key and on a team, like communicating, but um, how I recruit a team or how I get people together, I actually looked for diverse skills. Like I, I wanted, I learned about midway in my career that the best teams were, I needed people around me that thought differently than I did because it's easy to surround myself with people who think like I do, but it doesn't often give the best results. And I needed people that could challenge me. Uh, not everybody, but like you, you want a certain blend of less skilled, somebody who's smarter than I always love look for people who are smarter than me to get on my team. Um, and for me, it's more about attitude and willingness to work together. That's what I look for when I build a team. But I also look for people that are willing to challenge the status quo or have me think differently as we're coming up with solutions or moving an organization forward. Um, it's really important. But when a team is together, the big thing is, is communication. They, people need to know what's going on to the extent they can. And they need to be heard. They need to be, have a voice. And then when a decision is made, they also need to fall in line with the decision. So um, I had plenty of practice working with the disgruntled employee or the employee that really didn't fit in well. And sometimes you just have to help them find the right job. <laughs> and it's sometimes where they're at isn't the best place for their skills and abilities and helping people realize that maybe some, they need to be someplace else and, but having that honest communication with that person about where they're falling short and feedback is the best gift anybody can get. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Not well, always easy to give, but uh, that was one of my questions is how did you 
go about if you had somebody that wasn't a fit? And I think you've just answered my question, which was you had communication, you said, and you were honest with them about this really isn't a fit. Let's find one for you. Yeah. And I usually would start those conversations out with, how do you, Julie, how do you think it's going? I would ask the employee first how they felt things were going, and then I would get their perspective and I would understand what they were, what they thought, they, how they were doing. And then I could lo- give them the feedback from my perspective, which was always helpful. Did you find that most of them knew that it wasn't going well? Uh, no. <laughs> really? <laughs> I mean, often, uh, some do. Yes, some do. But there are times when people think it's just fine because that behavior has been acceptable for a lot of years, right? And one of the things about the agency is we switch jobs about every three years. So we get a new assignment. So if, if an employee comes new, it's, it's often, it takes a strong leader sometimes to manage those people, those issues, right? An employee who doesn't come to work on time or they're handing in work that's not top notch, right? And so the, either the employee's moving on or the supervisor's moving on. So oftentimes people kind of slide through the cracks for a few years and um, they don't always get the feedback. Did you change jobs every three years as well? Were you on different projects all within logistics? Like, do you stay in the same big umbrella or how does that work? It, uh, so I started in logistics and then I ended up in what we would call support operations. That's everything from HR to security to budget, um, anything that makes the organization facilities. So I started in logistics. Not everybody has that kind of broadening of their career into um, you, you might start as an analyst and stay as an analyst for 25 years. But I just I grew into kind of broader administrative roles. Um, and I did so, move every three years. Yeah. There's, there's way more to it than, you know, an American version of James Bond or, mm-hmm. or the born identity or, you know, these spy movies that we see. I think we forget how many people it takes to really protect us. And by the way, thank you for your service to help be help protect us in America. And I know other people around the world as well other countries, but I think that we get very short-sighted primarily because of the entertainment industry. And I, I have a friend that's an ER nurse and she loves to watch medical shows because she says, Oh my God, it's nothing like this. I have a friend who's a judge too. And she says, this isn't how it works. Would you say the same about some of those movies? Do you ever watch them just, and and it does it parallel even a little or is it just bit. all fabricated? I wouldn't say it's all fabricated. I think they do a good job of kind of scratching the surface. Like I, the one I can think of is Homeland. Like, and I love that because actually all the places that Carrie was are places I've been stationed. So I'll give you that little hint. Yeah. But um, I think what what's hard, even I didn't understand it when I was there. I As I got ready to retire, I went to a a job placement and I got a career person and talked to her and she goes, do you realize how unique what you did is? I'm like, no, like, because you were surrounded by people that moved every three years to a new job mm-hmm. that like had people's lives on their, you know, that they were worried about. So I never really took it for anything special. It was just the norm, right? Moving every three years to a new country, moving back to a place I used to live, but everything's changed. Um, so it, it, I, that's the part that I think most Americans just, it's like, it's probably very similar to the military as well. Just that same, that movement and that willingness to change and uproot families, people that have children that have to go to new schools and make new friends or get through a divorce and the wife is living in the States with the kids and the husbands overseas. Like it's, there's a lot of logistics that goes into just living life when you have a career like that. Well, and sacrifice too, Yeah, not only for the person who's working as a colleague of yours, but also for the family. I always thank military families too, the wives, the children. My husband grew up in an Air Force family and they moved all the time. And, mm-hmm. and when I meet somebody who's married 
to somebody in the military, whether it be a wife or a husband, I always thank them for their service as well, because they, they do a lot of heavy lifting with all the moves and the, the kids and the schools and the, all of that. Yeah. I often think they have the harder job actually, because they're not, I agree. In the, they're not in the fun part of actually doing the work and getting to see what's happening. They're doing all the other things. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, agree. Um, I often say, I talk about in my humble leadership that there's a ripple effect. And I learned this early on in my career, every decision, every leadership decision has a ripple effect. And it's not just the employee you're working with. It's the, the spouse, the child, the child's teacher, the child's swim coach. There is a ripple effect because that employee goes home every night, uh, you, uh, most nights, right? And those decisions we make, whether it's about the job or where they're going to next assignment's going to be, has a huge ripple effect. And it's important to think about our employees. Interesting point. I always talk about how, especially women and mothers in the home, you can come home from work and we've all experienced this where we had just a exhausting day at work and we're in a cranky mood and we walk in the house and everybody's fine. But all of a sudden, once our vibes in that house, the kids are going to start acting up and the dishwasher is going to break and flood the kitchen or whatever. And it's almost like whatever that vibration is of where our mood is, others in that house are going to meet it like a metronome. Absolutely. so very, very wise counsel from you that you were cognizant of that and, and had that in the forefront when you were making decisions. And I encourage other leaders, like people that are in leadership positions, but I also believe we're all leaders in everyday life. But like, I encourage people to think about that. It's not just the person we're working with. It's not just about the office. It goes well beyond that. Mm-hmm. Interesting. You said, quote, or you say, quote, it takes courage to be a kind leader, especially if you are in an organization focused solely on the bottom line, end quote. Talk more about that. What is, what is a kind leader? A kind leader is someone who understands their values and understands their purpose, right? Like a kind leader is somebody who thinks about what is Julie Ryan, like what just happened when her brother-in-law died, right? Like somebody who understands it's more than just about the work environment. And kindness can be everything from, I had a boss one time who saw that I swum across the Chesapeake Bay and he came in one morning and like made a scene that I, there was a newspaper article, right? I was mortified and embarrassed, but that boss, he was very senior. I thought he cares about me. He saw this article in the paper and he cares about me. That's a kind boss. And he was one of the, he was a great guy to work for. Um, And I think it does take courage because, and I think for women, at least at the agency, the leadership in women I saw were battle axes, women that were tough and hard because they want, they led just like they had been led to. And I think, especially for women it, and for men too, to be kind, it, people think it's, it's a weakness, but it's not. It's actually a huge strength and people gravitate to kind leaders. I mean, you have to be competent and smart and, and all those things and get the job done. But when there's an element of kindness, it changes the whole dynamic and people really want to come work with you when you're kind. That brings to mind this discussion that I think is very present in the woo-woo community about being an empath and that you don't want to be an empath because people are going to walk all over you. And and we're all empaths. We're all feeling what others are feeling when we walk in the room. We're uh, we're especially those of us that are that are knowledgeable about this, we can gauge to your point earlier, you kind of got a feel for the room when you walked in. What's your feeling about being an empath? And do you see that as a good, a bad, a neutral, a, something that's an asset? What are, what are your thoughts on being an empath? 
my thought is it can make it harder on us when we're an empath if we're not careful and, and recognizing that we're, an, I think an empath, being empathic can be a huge strength. I know it's a strength because you understand what's going on beneath the surface. And that's actually such huge knowledge when you're leading an organization to understand what's going on. Um, but having the right tools, and I think this is where angelic attendant training comes in, is having the right tools to detach from. Take You don't want to take out it on and, and hold on to it and sleep with it at night. You want to detach from those things that we pick up on during the day. So you, you taught the great, you know, the tools of detaching at night, every night and or washing ourselves with a white light at, so that we clear our bodies in our etheric field from those things we take on during the day. I wouldn't be say I'm neutral. I actually think being an empath is a strength. It's just knowing how to detach when we need to. I agree. And I'm interested to hear what your thoughts are from being an empath into being a kind leader. Do they go hand in hand? Does one foster the other? Do you see a connection? Oh, I think there's a connection. Um, because I think people who are like, who are sociopaths and can't feel they can't, they don't know how to be kind. It's, it's a show or they, but I think we have to feel to know. I think definitely there's a connection between being an empath and being kind. Yes. I agree. I agree. I think it's a, an asset. I agree with mm-hmm. you on that as well. All right. Let's switch gears a little bit. Mm-hmm. You're an author. You're an author and you've written a series of children's books called Everybody Loves Grace, where you use your dog, I refer to her as Princess Grace, (laughs) to teach how simple acts of kindness, we're back on the kindness Mm -hmm. theme again, can change lives and can have a profound effect on others. So tell us about Grace. How How did you start doing those books? Did you do it while you were still with the CIA? Just give us the history on these books. They're terrific, everybody. Oh my gosh, they're just fabulous. So tell us about Grace, how you got this idea and where it's taking you. Sure. Well, Grace is an empath and she is a healer. So I think I learned a lot from Grace, but Grace is uh, my 15-year-old Finnish Lapland. And she came to me when she was four years old and she came from a very, really abusive home and the, the wife decided that she needed to find a safe place. So Grace came to live with me in Denver. And one day I was, I also had a friend that kept saying, you need to write a book, Katie. So um, little did I know the books would be about Grace. It was after an encounter at Denver Health, the head of the paramedics one day stopped dead in his tracks, says he was petting Grace. And he says, if only I could start my day like this every day. And then I got a message from spirit that said, that book you're supposed to write, Katie, it has nothing to do with you. And it's supposed to be about grace and her story. And so that was, and I was arguing with God, like, are you kidding me? And God's like, nope, you're supposed to write about grace. And I was like, really? I like, I don't even have kids. I'm not, how am I going to write a book? And, uh, and so I followed that guidance was, and I argued for quite a while. And then I just said, what's the worst that can happen? So Grace is just this amazing, she has an amazing ability to know who's the most needy, needed person in her room. Like if I have book club over, she sits by the person and I know who's hurting the most that night because Grace goes and sits by them. Or we go to Walgreens and we walk by the prescription line and she'll pick somebody and she'll sit right in front of them and they pet her. And I think, ah, that's probably the sickest person in line. I just know Grace has this incredible ability. To, to know people. And the books are just sweet. Um, there's six of them. And the first one is about simple acts of kindness. And Grace just holds space for people. I mean, she people talk to her, you know, COVID people say, can I pet Grace? Because I need to touch something. You know, I need to touch something soft and warm because they people hadn't been touching each other. And um, they've just been, I'm so grateful I followed the guidance because the first book led to the second, and now we're at the sixth. And each book has a, a life lesson. I call them life lessons from grace. Like in book six, she talks about aging with grace and about accepting help from people. You know, we 
some of our elderly don't like to accept help or they want, you know, they, so Grace talks about aging with grace. And um, one of the books she talks about better get so everything on your bucket list. Like I got to my bucket list. I drove to Pennsylvania and back. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and they're just sweet. I call them um, their the books are all told through Grace's eyes and she's right here. She knows we're um, on this interview together. She's right over here. <laughs> So she's never far away. Did you find that the longer you had her, the more her skills developed or did she just come in right out of the shoot like that? And do you think it had something to do with her having been abused? Because certainly some animals that have been abused can turn the other way and they can be really ferocious to be around. And I think grace is the opposite end of that spectrum. I think that's a really great question. I never thought about it, but I think her being abused made her, she reads a room better than I read a room. Right. Like, and people joke about that grace. She can work a room. Like when we have book signings, she's, I leave her off leash and she works a room and she's incredible. So I think, I don't think she, she must have come with it. And I think it grew as we, after I had another dog who died and when it was just grace and I, I think that's when I really noticed it blossom. Um, one day we were walking down Broadway and this gentleman sitting on a bench and Grace pulled me over to him. And I was like, really, Grace, do we have to? And she said, yep. And it turns out he had just gotten a terminal diagnosis. He had been at Denver Health and Grace went over to say good morning to him. And he, he talked to us and then she waited until his bus came. And then when he got on the bus, she turned around and said, we can go home. So she, like, things like that happen almost every day. Well, and the fact that she came to you, why do you think that is? How have you been able, obviously through the books, but how else have you been able to facilitate the literal grace that she imparts on people who seem to be in most need of her comfort? I think I know it's no accident. She came to live with me and, um, she's taught me how to hold space even better than ever. Like she's taught me that, but I think what's most important is grace has helped me find my voice. I think this, I've been doing public speaking and keynote speech speaking and writing the books is me stepping out from behind the CIA life and being willing to be seen. And I think grace has brought me that encouragement. It, it, she was the first step, the, her books. And now I've, stepped into the speaking and the humble yet fierce memoir that I'm writing. I would have never done that five years ago, but through her, this experience with her, um, that's why I think, I think she is leading me to the light. (laughs) Well, and certainly animals have been perceived as spirit guides by all cultures since the beginning of time. And they show up in different ways both alive and when they're in spirit form. I have a friend who was at a, some kind of a drum ceremony thing with native Americans. And, and it was some kind of a graduation thing for her. And I was talking to her and I did an instant replay of it. And I saw this form of an Eagle coming out of the fire and going straight up, it was almost like a phoenix rising from the ashes. And she said that she could feel that when that was happening. And so could everybody else. She said everybody was just covered in goosebumps. And so I think spirit, God, whatever you want to call the source, uses animals oftentimes because they're so disarming. Mm -hmm. And Grace's personality, I know, is so just approachable and loving and kind to, to teach us in a lot of ways. Absolutely. And I, I want to believe that grace isn't alone. Like I think other dogs and cats and animals are just as able to, to lead us and teach us. Like it's just, we have to be willing to um, acknowledge their gifts and be willing to follow. Like, I let Grace lead on our walks because I know she knows where we're going. And I know there's somebody she's got to see on that walk. Like I don't, I rarely force her to go a certain direction. And I think if 
everybody that has a pet at home, their animal has the same ability to guide and help lead us in whatever lesson it is we're supposed to learn. <laughs> well, and I believe too, that they're in our lives at the absolute perfect time to help us on our journey. And then when their mission is completed, then they go to dog heaven and their spirits around us. And as heart wrenching as that is, then we'll have another animal. If we're a pet lover show up, who's going to help us on the next phase of our journey. Have you considered that just because of Grace's age? Yeah, I actually have. And that's partially how she came to me because Tinto was 15 at the time. And I was like, I'm not ready to be without a, so I asked him for permission and he said, yep, we can get another dog. And I have thought about it with grace and I, um, she doesn't want another animal in the house yet. So I'm uh, listening to that and honoring that for sure. Um, I don't, I will have another animal at some point, but, um, yeah, at 15, I know my, like, I'm just grateful for every healthy day I have with her. Oh my gosh. I bet. Well, when she talks to you, describe what that, how that is for you. Does she, do you hear it in your head? Do you hear it with your ears? What's, does she show you something? Does she shake her head? Yes and no. Does she wave her paw? I mean, what does she do it's to very, let you know? It's very similar to what you teach us with um, angelic, at, you know, talking to spirit is I ask the question and the first thing that pops in my mind. So I ask Grace a question. The first thing that pops in my mind is her answer. So yeah, that's how it works with me. It works with any spirit, whether it's attached to an animal or not, whether it's a, whether it's a spirit not attached to a body, whether it's a human, an animal, a tree, it doesn't matter. That's been my experience that that's how it works. And I know that you've gotten involved in the performing arts at this new phase of your life. So tell us about that. How does a girl from the CIA go to being a performer? A book, a children's book writer about a dog mm-hmm. and a and a performer now. So I was I went to the gala for the Opera Colorado, and the woman sitting next to me is a true icon in Denver and actually in the world. Her name is Cleo Parker Robinson, and she runs a nonprofit dance studio. And they had a, a auction for to be an extra in Tosca, the opera of Tosca. And she kept saying, darling, darling, you must do this. I'm like, no, no. And she kept putting my number up. So I actually um, was, it was part of the auction to, to be an extra in Tosca. And it was the best experience of my life. That was last November. I was uh, a church goer and I was part of the choir and the today I'm choir. It was just beautiful from my logistics background to watch the whole thing come together, how they get the rehearsals progress and bringing the sets in. It was just amazing. And then I got a call about three weeks ago and they said, Katie, you were so much fun in Tusca. Will you be in Carmen? And I said, sure, I'll be in Carmen. So I'm currently in Carmen opening nights tomorrow night in Denver. Um, We had our last dress rehearsal last night and I'm a picador in the parade in act four. And uh, Again, it's just been phenomenal to be around that high vibration music. Oh my gosh, to be part of these world class singers and the Colorado orchestra and and choir. It's just amazing. And we have six performances between now and the end of May. And so you're costumed and you're what are you dressed as? Are you dressed as a military kind of person or? I'm the, I'm actually dressed as a man. They, they needed somebody who could fit in this costume. So I'm fitting in the costume and it's it's hilarious. The first dress rehearsal, I had a wig with a a ponytail. They had me with a ponytail and it's, oh, it's, it's so detailed. It's lacy and jeweled and it's the, the cranberry-ish scarf and the hat and they put the wig on. And I went to the next dress rehearsal and they said, you have to have short hair. And I said, why? And last night I found out why they said, is that her real hair? That's horrible. And the wig lady said, no, that's a wig. So they put me in, I am in a short, so I'm a man. And I, we walk in with the parade and the last scene, it's just 
and the costumes, even people in the choir are like, oh my gosh, those are amazing. So, oh, wonderful. Yeah. Terrific. Well, I think you're a great example to people how you don't need to stay focused just in one area of your life and, and where your interest lies, you can pursue things along those lines. And it really can just enhance your life in so many ways. I, I always <laughs> laugh because my husband, Tim always says I'm an information suck because I just, <laughs> I'm just naturally curious. I want to know a lot about a lot of different things. And, and I'm interested in sports and I'm interested in art and I'm interested in music and I'm interested in business and, you know, and architecture and whatever. And he just, I think I wear him out sometimes. And I know you are a lot of the same way. And can you talk just for a minute about how that's enhanced your life and, and what you would recommend to people that are listening that how they can do the same and what it could do for their lives. I, I absolutely. So that it kind of goes back to my, just say yes. You know, when, when Cleo said, Katie, you've got to do this. I just said, yes. Right. I didn't know where it was going to lead. In fact, when they called me up because of COVID, they didn't do it for two years. And they said, are you still interested? And I said, of course, yes. Right. But I think my advice to listeners is to just say yes. And, have the step out in faith and know you're being guided. If the opportunity presents itself, it's there for a reason. And that's how we learn and grow and we meet new people and we learn just like to be around different things. It's, it's just wonderful. So I just say, just say yes. No, you have courage because you've done courageous things in your life before. And then just step out in faith and know that you're being guided to do this. Amen. I agree. I concur with everything you just said. <laughs> How can people find out more about you? Some of our listeners may be in the position to bring you in for a speaking engagement mm -hmm. or or whatever. So how can people find out more about you and get in contact with you? I have a website. It's katiemcquade.com. And that is where my speaking and my workshop uh, offerings are located and you can find out more about me. There's information on my website. That's katiemcquade.com. And then the grace books are at everybodylovesgrace.com. And I would love for people to visit that website as well. We talk about grace and the Finnish Lapland and her books are there and her plush toy. <laughs> and Katie is spelled with a Y. So it's K-A-T-Y mcquade.com. Yes. And yeah. so you can find her there. Thank you so much for taking the time to share your life's journey with us. You are a fascinating, as I mentioned, just extraordinary woman and human. And, uh, and I'm, I just love and adore you and I'm thrilled you're in my life. And to those of you that are listening and watching, have a great weekend. I'll be back next week with a live show and sending you lots of love from sweet home, Alabama. Mwah! And Denver, too, from Katie. Bye, everybody. Be sure to follow Julie on Instagram and YouTube at Ask Julie Ryan. And like her on Facebook at Ask Julie Ryan. To schedule an appointment or submit a question, please visit AskJulieRyan.com. This show is for informational purposes only. It is not intended to be medical, psychological, financial, or legal advice. Please contact a licensed professional. The Ask Julie Ryan Show, Julie Ryan and all parties involved in producing, recording, and distributing it assume no responsibility for listeners' actions based on any information heard on this or any Ask Julie Ryan shows or podcasts.